and welcome back to our channel. If you like crimes and unsolved cases, and of course exploring the unknown, then you are at the right place. Please hit the like, subscribe, and the bell so you can get notified on what's coming up next on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Having a baby is a wonderful time and knowing you're going to be planning and being there the very first step of the way. This beautiful woman who just had her son and was just walking home minded her own business. She did not have a chance of that with her son. That night she was attacked and killed by a man that did not care about life. To understand what happened we need to go back to the beginning. Jessica Kern was a very young, vibracious 18-year-old woman. She was a daughter of a local fire chief, Joe Curran, and her mom was her best friend, Jean Curran. She had told her parents she had gotten raped by a man named Jeremy Adams. He was a petty criminal and a small-time drug dealer. She had her son, and she did name him Zion. She really adored her son with all her heart and wanted to raise him the best way she knew. And she wanted the help of her parents. So what could go wrong? She was walking home one late night, like normal, like every other night she had done before. On July 30th of 2000, it was very late and she just wanted to get home as soon as possible to her son and family. The remains of a woman was found at the Mayfield Middle School. It was a horrific scene. The police were called to the scene and found out what happened to her. Officer Tim Fortner was on the scene at first. He thought it was just a mannequin that maybe some kids had set a fire. But on closer inspection of the body, he knew it was not a mannequin. And there was flies on this person everywhere. She was an African American girl. Looked like she might have been a young teenager. Her skin had been burned and so was her clothes. She did not have any underwear and they were just ripped off of her, laying right beside her. She had been bludgeoned in her face, almost unrecognizable. Even her tongue was forced out of her mouth. There was a black belt that was burned in her really tight around her throat and there was a bottle at her feet that smelled like petrol. She had her nose broke and also marks on her head. They were very deep wounds. At first, Tim Fortner just looked and stared at the body. Fortner's 31 and he was assigned on this case. This was his very first case and he did not know what to do or what needs to be done. Now, you see, Faulkner was the lowest on the town's police department. This came as a surprise to him when the police chief gave him this case to him and he had no experience of dealing with any kind of murder cases. He said, I didn't have a clue what to do next. I had no idea how to organize a crime or look for forensic evidence. Frankly, I was scared stiff. The cause of her death has never been determined. She was finally identified as Jessica Kern. So what happened to her and why would anyone want to kill her? Now this case had lots of forensic evidence at the crime scene. Fortner's way of investigating it was not up to par, and the police chief, Ronnie Lear, did not seem to be worried about it at all. This case was like out of the old-fashioned movie where no one knew what to do or where to go with the evidence. It find a lock of hair, and it looked like it might have been torn out from a human head, and it was laying by Jessica's body, and it was labeled Item 9 and it should have been taken right to the police station. But however, it never made it downtown. 
The item that did make it is the DNA from her fingernails and a strand of hair in her hand, like maybe she had grabbed the killer's head and pulled the hair right out from it, and it just got lodged in her hand. Now, once the evidence that did make it to the police station had gotten contaminated with evidence from another case that they were working on, two other swabs from a rape case that did not belong to Jessica had wound up in her case, and they had somehow ended up in Curran's box. I know what you're thinking. How in the world would that be? make such a bonehead mistake like how would they ever catch a killer or killers me too three years had passed of course with no arrest in sight until the case had caught an eye of an extraordinary woman named susan gelbrith she was not an expert or even experienced at all in solving cases but however she had a beautiful warm heart and she just wanted justice for the victim There was one name that kept coming up when she was investigating, and it was Jeremy Adams, a 22-year-old and, like I said, a petty criminal. And he was Jessica's baby's father. Fortner just knew he had to do something with Jessica's murder. So what did Fortner do? He arrested Jeremy for the murder of Jessica. And just days before he was scheduled for trial, the judge, Dogaday, threw his hands up as he looked at the case and he dismissed the charges against Jeremy. I have never seen a case so encumbered with problems, the judge said, and I hope I never see another one. Now Susan was gathering all the information, trying to fix this botched job that Fortner had done. Susan knew that Jessica deserved better than what she had gotten in her death. So she wanted to find out who killed her and why. She had told CBS that somebody's has to do something. In April of 2004, she had emailed Tom Mangold. Now, he was a senior at BBC Reporter in London, who Susan had watched on 60 Minutes. Now, Tom had flown out to Kentucky for several days to help Susan with this case. And in doing so, with the information they had gotten, one name kept coming up as a possible killer of Jessica. When Ben Gold and Susan submitted their findings to the police, they didn't even care. Manhold had went back empty-handed to his home back in London. But the story didn't stop there. Susan was determined to find the killer of Jessica. Now, Susan knew that the killer was a convicted sex offender and a drug dealer. Now, Jessica's father was trying to keep Jessica's case alive, and he did some protesting at the local state and federal offices. In 2004, Jessica's father convinced a newly elected Attorney General, Greg Stumbo, to take over the case to find out what had happened to his beautiful daughter. So this came in as a cop plot right out of a TV show, guys. State police had wired up Susan to interview the suspect in on 2005 of February. She was posing as a true crime author doing a research on Jessica's case. The man revealed very little to Susan, but however, he did question Susan about whether the police had any kind of DNA evidence from the crime scene and off the body. With Susan not getting much from the suspect, the case did stall. So Susan created a MySpace tribute to Jessica. It was called Justice for Jessica. She was hoping to get some kind of tips to solve the case. Then in February 2007, a California woman, Victoria Caldwell, had posted a comment I will help the police as much as I can, but I really don't know who to trust. I'm afraid someone might kill me if I testify to things about this. Can you help me? Susan had got a hold of Caldwell. She had told Susan that she was among several people who had witnessed Jessica's murder. 
the state investigators did not waste time to fly out to California and Caldwell identified the murderer as Quincy Cross. This was the same suspect that Susan had interviewed her that his name kept coming up as well. Caldwell said that her and several others were in a car when Cross had picked up Jessica. She was just walking home late that night. He had knocked her unconscious when he, she had resisted his sexual advances. Cross, 23 then, at the time of the murder, took Jessica to his friend's house where then they, he had raped and choked her with a belt, then clubbed her with his wrench. He told the witnesses to violate the victim, to implicate them as well, so they do not go to the cops. Then they dumped the body at the school and set her on fire with gas. It did turn out that Cross and his friends were identified as the suspect within days after the murder. Cross had been swabbed for evidence after a deputy sheriff found him in a broken down Pontiac that reeked of gas on the morning Jessica was found. Also, Caldwell, on the day Jessica was found, she was in protective custody at the cop's house. She had said she knew something about Jessica's murder, but Caldwell ended up walking away from that house and Manfield's finest did not follow up on Cross or Caldwell at all. Now as Caldwell, as the chief witness, Cross was convicted in 2008 for the murder of Jessica and sentenced to life without parole. Caldwell and the three others served time as for his accomplices. Now, Officer Fortner had resigned from Mayfield's job in 2003. He did go on to a nearby police carrier in Murray, Kentucky. Jessica's son, Zion, was raised by Jessica's parents, Joe and Jean Kern. He did finish high school, where he won an award for being a winning runner. Susan Caldbreath had won her own award in 2009. The state police presented to Susan with a special Kentucky Outstanding Citizen Award for her role in solving Jessica's case and never giving up. She called it the proudest moment in her life. Sadly, Susan died of natural causes on August. She was only 58 years old. With this, we'll end this case, guys. Now tell me what you think. Do you think that the police brass did a really bad job for putting a greenhorn on the case and in charge? And also, do you think that Susan could have let the police handle the case instead of taking over? Let me know what you think, guys, in the comments. I do read them. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time. Bye.